We've seen so much about lossless compression by now that we're almost at the point where we can call ourselves lossless compression experts. Almost. I don't think we're quite there. I don't think we can call ourselves experts in one subfield of compression, like lossless compression, until we've seen the other side, until we've appreciated the constraints that experts in lossy compression have to work with. And certainly in a general course like this, on compression in general, we can't go around calling ourselves compression experts until we've explored lossy techniques. So bear with me for a few slides. I wanna do a bit of soul searching maybe discuss some of the privileges we have if we think only of lossless compression that we don't have if we're working on lossy compression schemes. I'm gonna do this, and in general, our case study of lossy compression is going to work with images. So I'm gonna talk about images for a while. Uh, here is this image of a pair that I've used quite a few times uh, in this course and over my career. I just like pairs. Uh, this particular image uh, is 500 by 335 pixels. Now that's the size of the image file. Uh, on your screen it probably shows up as a different size. Certainly on my slide, which is being rendered at 1080p, it shows up um, probably a little bit bigger than its real resolution. Okay, whatever. That's the size the image is stored in. We're going to need to know that if we want to compare its compressed size to its uncompressed size. So it's 500 by 335 pixels. It is stored in the RGB color space, which is pretty common for everyday digital images. Certainly if you're working in some subdomain of digital image processing, so if you're working with extremely high definition or high color depth images, uh, or with broadcast video in some cases, as we'll see in a couple of lectures, you might work in some color system other than RGB, but odds are if you've worked with images before, you are pretty familiar with RGB colors. Um, and so in an RGB image, each pixel is stored as a combination of red, green, and blue values. And normally, even in 2023, we typically use eight bits for each component. So each of R, G, and B is stored in eight bits. So that means one pixel is in an uncompressed representation going to be 24 bits. Uh, I guess I should give a brief review of how RGB colors work. Um, so because these are all stored in eight bits, we could represent them as values between zero and 255 inclusive. We could also think of the RGB triple as values in any arbitrary range. So in some applications, you see RGB values expressed as fractional values between zero and one, which is a nice abstraction, but I'm not gonna use that because we actually care about this, the fact that it's underneath actually going to be only eight bits. So why not represent them using unsigned integer values? Um, and so recall that if I set each of red, green, and blue to zero, then I am referring to the color black. And if I set each of red, green, and blue to their maximum value, and in our 8-bit case, that would be 255, I am referring to the color white. Uh, and the idea behind this is that RGB colors mix like light, not like paint. So if I increase the red, green, or blue value, I am increasing the intensity of red, green, or blue in, if we think of this as mixing beams of light. So if I mix together the maximum amount of red, green, and blue, I'm going to get white light. If I mix together no red, no green, and no blue, I'm going to get no light. So we could, we could think of that as the color black uh, in this image. Um, now, there are other ways of blending colors. So if we think about the way we blend paints, if I mix together every color of paint that I have, I'm probably going to get something that's a weird, muddy, dark gray or black or brownish color. Um, whereas if I mix together no paint and I paint my canvas with nothing, then I guess my canvas is left at its original color, which is often white. So paint and light mix sort of in opposite ways. Um, so red the RGB system mixes like light. That, that's, that's my ultimate point here, just in case you don't already know that. Um, if I were to store this image using three bytes uh, per pixel, so 24 bits, uh, one byte for each of red, green, and blue, then this image comes out to be about 500K in size. Um, now, as usual, our problem is reduce the space requirement of the image. And although this is a lecture that brings us into the domain of lossy compression, we're not quite there yet. So what can we do using techniques that we already have to compress this image? Um, and you'll notice actually the prompt is a little bit different than usual. Reduce the space requirements of the image. It's phrased a little bit more ambiguously than it usually is. So we can throw it toward, we can throw it at our big three, as we've done earlier in the course. The uncompressed representation, if each pixel is stored in three bytes, and we store no metadata, so typically with an image format, you're gonna store some metadata, like information about the resolution, or the color system, or, or the creation time, or other things like that. Suppose we do none of that. If we just store each pixel and nothing else, it comes out to be 502K, or 502,500 bytes. If I then throw it into my big three, my general purpose lossless compression tools, deflate comes in at about 357K, which is more than half of the original size, 
And the best of the three, which is LZMA, comes in at 302. They're pretty clustered, and none of them can get me a compression ratio greater than 2.0. You'll notice a newcomer uh, to our list, PNG. So PNG stands for Portable Network Graphics. It is a lossless format, which is why it's reasonable for me to stick it in the same table as our other lossless compressors. It's a format specialized for images. So although it's a lossless format, it's doing something that gives it an advantage over my big three. And we shouldn't be too surprised about that. So remember lecture number six? We are able to outperform the big three um, with some effort if we know a lot about about the input data with which we are working, and of course PNG does. So it shouldn't surprise us too much that PNG can do better than our general purpose methods uh, on images. Now what I will observe is none of these techniques, including PNG, can give us a compression ratio above 2.0. And you might hear that and say, well, why do we care about that? And there it is, the privilege of the lossless compression expert. Um, now, more importantly, whether or not 2.0 is our magic number, none of them can guarantee any particular compression ratio. And you should stare at that and say, why do we care about that either? That Why should that make any difference? All um, this time, during this entire course, up until this point, we haven't worried about that. In fact, I thought we proved in lecture number two that this was a fool's errand, that this was impossible. And again, there it is. That's one of the reasons why we can't truly appreciate um, lossless compression until we've seen the other side. This assumption, the fact that we don't need to guarantee a compression ratio, that we can write our deflate encoder or our bzip encoder and say, yeah, on some inputs, um, we're gonna have bad compression. On some inputs, we could get expansion. That's a privilege that a lossless compression person gets that in general a compression expert doesn't usually have. And I think we need to do a little bit of soul searching. So the soul searching is going to come down to a basic question that I thought we talked about on the first day of class. What is the point of compression? Why do we compress our data to begin with? And I think the answer is pretty clear. It's because I want to save space, right, Bill? Like, that's, that's the point of the course. I want to save space. I want to use fewer bits. Well, of course that's the point of compression. But what do we mean by that? I want to use fewer bits when? Is it sufficient to say I tried my best and I was able to save you five bits? Is it sufficient to say I tried my best and now you need 4,000 more bits? What's the point of compression? When have we failed? So the way we've studied it, um, compression really, if, if we try and break it down theoretically or in a sort of philosophical way, compression is a way of trading one form of resource for another. Um, all of us that have studied algorithms in the past, and of course that's all of us, understand that when you're studying, for example, algorithms and data structures earlier in, in your degree, there's often a trade-off you have to make. Do I use this algorithm that requires more space but then takes less time, or an algorithm that requires more time but requires less space? And that's a trade-off between how much time do you have and how much memory are you willing to use. Um, what do you believe the amount of memory you have in your computer um, will be able to fit in terms of inputs that you're likely to process. So that's one of the usual trade-offs you make when you're choosing algorithms um, in any other context in computer science. I would argue that compression in a lot of ways, lossless compression at least, is an extension of that logic. There are other resources that we often have to worry about, other constrained resources, things like bandwidth and storage. I have a network connection and I want to send you a file. I'd rather not spend too much time sending that file. I'm willing to spend a bit of processing time on my end, and you have to spend some on your end, in exchange for you receiving receiving the bits or receiving the bits com comprising that file faster. Um, and one of the reasons we do that is because maybe our network connection is a great deal slower than our processor. So I've got lots of processor cycles to waste. I'm being blocked by my network bandwidth. Or on the other hand, I want to store a bunch of files. I want to keep things for archival purposes. I don't have that much disk space. And for better or for worse, the availability of disk space on my laptop or on a, a, the average desktop computer hasn't seemed to escalate as quickly as processor processor time or processor power and memory. So if you look back over the past, let's say, 10 years, you'll actually notice that the average size of a hard drive that ships with a computer hasn't changed that much. It's gone up a bit, but not that much compared to the average increase in processor power. Um, so uh, it makes sense that I might say, look, I'm willing to spend a bit of processor time because my processor would otherwise be idle. I'm willing to spend some processor time to save bits so I don't need to use as much disk space or as much network bandwidth. And so in a large, to a large extent, compression is just a way of studying 
informally that trade-off, ways of making the trade-off between spending processor cycles now as opposed to having to use more network bandwidth or more disk space. And one of the reasons why that's a good idea is because it turns out that computers tend to have lots of processing time and memory available um, versus network bandwidth or disk space or disk bandwidth. So even if I have a lot of disk space, it might take a long time to write stuff to disk. Disks are actually really slow compared to main memory and processors. And that means in some cases, running a relatively low-key lossless compression algorithm can actually result in me being able to finish my processing of a file faster because I don't have to write as much data to disk and disk is so slow. Um, and you probably know all of that already from an architecture course or something earlier in your degree. So that's the, the overarching reason, and I think a very good philosophy of what compression is, why we study compression. But as lossless compression experts, we also know from the very first day of class or from lecture number two, when it was proven more formally, that we can't expect compression that um, we can develop techniques that work well on the data we're actually likely to see, but that we always have this get out of jail free card in our back pocket, even on average data. So whether we can compress a tale of two cities or not, you could find me some other book by Charles Dickens and my scheme might make it larger. It might result in expansion. And I'm allowed to just invoke the fact that we can't expect compression. I can say, sorry, I'm a lossless compression person. And that means that all of my compression schemes might not work in some cases. That's not my fault. That's your fault for expecting more of me. Um, and of course, lossless compression is a difficult topic as we've seen over this course, but this is sort of an easy excuse. There are lots of cases in practice where the reasons we need compression aren't because I'd like it if I can save a little bit of disk space, it's because I have no other choice. I literally don't have any more disk space available. If you expand my input, I'm completely out of luck. I have no other options. And so if we focus entirely on lossless compression, the excuse that we can't expect compression, the excuse that our inputs sometimes expand becomes just a little bit too easy. It allows us to not really live in the real world. So one thing we should think about, a philosophical question, is is compression important in the long term? In the grand scheme of things, as uh, humans approach the limitations of the underlying um, technology that they're using, so as transistors get smaller and smaller, and therefore it becomes harder and harder to make fast processors without just having more and more processors or whatever, and the same is true of memory, therefore maybe disk space catches up, maybe network bandwidth catches up. Over time, um, you know, network bandwidth is increasing, and as processor uh, development becomes more and more difficult, maybe network bandwidth catches up over time. Or maybe we end up not having powerful processors in our laptops because we delegate all of our computation to central supercomputers and therefore need a huge amount of network bandwidth to communicate with them. And so over time, as network bandwidth catches up, will compression really be that important? Will it turn out that we don't need to make a trade-off anymore because all things are equal? Um, so that's one philosophical point that I don't really know if I can answer in, in, over the course of discussing this slide, but it's also something worth considering. Considering. But I would argue that it's something that's, that's equally as nebulous to consider as a lot of other questions about things like algorithms and data structures. So will we always have von Neumann architectures? Will our computing devices as they exist really be deterministic machines in 100 years? Um, so we can't answer questions like that. But that's an interesting philosophical point to consider when considering what compression is and what compression means. But what I want to focus in on as far as lossless compression is concerned is the fact that we have this option to fail. We're allowed with our lossless schemes, with deflate and bzip and any other scheme that we develop, including the ones, the, the temporary schemes that we developed in lectures five and six, to say, oh yeah, the scheme didn't work very well because, you know, lossless schemes sometimes fail. We're always going to get expansion on some inputs. Maybe we just weren't lucky this time. And we hope to save space, but we know that if we don't save space, we've got that clever excuse that we can make. And I would argue that in some ways, although it's really important that people study lossless compression schemes, and lossless compression schemes expose a lot of really powerful facts about data and information, if we always have that excuse in our back pocket, we're sort of doing compression recreationally. We're doing it because we enjoy the satisfaction of achieving compression. We like the benefits when we can achieve them, but we always have this option of saying, sorry, not my problem. Sometimes we get expansion. Oops. And in a sense, we're not really... Um, 
subjecting ourselves to the trial by fire that compression actually receives in practice, that lossy schemes have to deal with. Um, we basically are allowed to make this excuse that our scheme may fail because we adhere so rigorously to this requirement that the decompressed result be identical, that we are able to prove that our scheme has to be allowed to fail in some cases. We saw that in lecture two. We can't assume compression will always be possible if we also require that our decompressed result is identical to the original input. So just to remind ourselves, here are the priorities of a lossless compressor. And uh, the biggest priority, really, it's not fair to put the other three in the same list. I mean, this is priority one through 100, and this is priority, I don't know, 101, uh, because a priority number one is so important that I really can't compromise under any circumstances. Um, and so in lossless compression, of course, I require integrity. The integrity of the data must be preserved. That is non-negotiable. If, if you are not able to reproduce identically the original input after the, the decompression stage, then you don't have a lossless compressor. So I don't even need to bother evaluating it. That is because, of course, for lossless compression, any loss is a travesty. Um, and then, of course, beyond that, I'd like it if I can achieve compression. We saw this in lecture two. It, it's weird that, you know, achieving compression is actually not our first priority. It's, our, I guess, our second priority. And then beyond that, I guess, I would like to keep memory consumption and processing time in check. Um, there are, of course, a lot of time I will make compromises. A lot of times I'm willing to spend an extra day waiting for the compression to finish if in exchange my compressed size is way better. But ultimately, there are, there's a wall that I hit if integrity is my first priority. And we've also seen over, the, over this course in many different ways that lossless compression is really input sensitive. I can develop a lot of clever compression schemes, but ultimately um, the characteristics of a specific input will dictate how well I can compress. I can't develop a scheme that on every single example of a certain class of input, at least if the input is broadly defined, I'm guaranteed to get compression. Instead, if I, for example, care about things like lossless image compression, I might focus in on characteristics that are common to real images. So if you feed in an image that you've constructed synthetically to try and break my scheme, I'm not going to worry so much because I have that excuse that some inputs always expand and my goal is to work with realistic data. But in practice, when I compress images, so when I want to display an image in somebody's web browser or when I want to send them streaming video, which of course is a sequence of images, um, I have to consider that maybe that streaming video could contain literally anything. And they need to be able to receive the streaming video to view it. They're not going to accept um, YouTube putting up a warning saying, sorry, I'm not sending you this video because I'm a compression scheme and I'm allowed to fail. They want to see the video. Even if the video looks sort of awful, they want to see it. They will not accept no for an answer. Um, so priorities of lossless compressors are great for what we've been doing for fully lossless compression, but in the world of compression, there's a lot more to compression than just lossless schemes. So if I want to compress images and video, I actually have a different set of constraints. So for example, you are watching this video right now, I assume, uh, and this video is a set of still frames that have been, that give the illusion of motion where motion exists. So when I scribble on the screen or whatever, synchronized to audio. Each of the frames of video might actually require a different amount of bandwidth to send. But ultimately, when YouTube sends you these frames of video, it has to make sure it can fit whatever it sends you inside the bandwidth available. The bandwidth available to YouTube, but also probably more importantly, the bandwidth available to you. Whether you're watching this from a hardwired connection or over Wi-Fi, or for some reason you've decided to watch my lecture on the bus. Um, if you're going to watch stuff on the bus, that sounds great. If you're going to use your mobile data for that, but why this? There's plenty of more interesting things. Whatever. Okay. I'm being, maybe I'm being too modest. Maybe this lecture truly is amazing. Um, but you're watching it wherever and you have a certain amount of bandwidth available and that bandwidth is hard limited. You can't exceed it. YouTube isn't allowed to say, sorry, I'm going to need you to upgrade your connection for 10 or 11 frames because I've got a lot of data I have to send you and I'm allowed to fail at my compression technique. It's not allowed um, to, to not meet your bandwidth criteria in certain cases. You have to meet it in all cases. It is an absolute limit. And that means that you're no longer allowed to put integrity first. So priorities when you're working with streaming images and video, or, or I guess I'm, I'm mostly couching this in terms of streaming video, it applies to any um, compressed data like images and video where the size of the uncompressed data is unreasonably large. Um, usually, I think we would rank priorities like this. So first, the compressed data must fit within a certain size. Um, that could be because you are storing it on some storage medium. 
So a long time ago, we used to distribute video on discs like DVDs or Blu-ray discs, and they had a finite capacity. And we have to be able to, if we have some feature film we are putting on our DVD or our Blu-ray disc, it has to be able to fit. But of course, nowadays, I will couch this in terms of bandwidth. You are receiving, let's say, 30 or 60 frames per second of video from YouTube or some other streaming service, and it's important that you be able to receive that inside of the bandwidth of your connection, which might be pretty low. Um, also, because that is a lot of data, so 60 frames of 1080p video or 30 frames of 1080p video is a lot of data. And that means that your processor might be strained, especially if you're using a mobile device or something. So after the fact that I have to be able to fit it inside of a certain size, I have to be willing to compromise such that the, the data you end up receiving can actually be decompressed in a reasonable amount of time because your processor needs to be able to decompress it with real-time performance. To a lesser extent, I have to be able to send it in a way that is convenient for me. So if I am YouTube, I have to be able to send you the video in a way that, that allows me to um, fit within my allocated resources. That's a bit easier for YouTube because it could do the compression in advance. It doesn't necessarily have to always compress in real time. But you're aware that you can watch streams of live... Th I mean, okay, the fact that live streaming exists isn't surprising to anybody in 2023. I'm showing my age. Um, live streaming is a thing. It does exist. Live streamed video, of course, has to be compressed in such a way that both compressor and decompressor can do their job in essentially real time. So it's okay to have latency. It's okay to put a few frames of video in and not get them back until 500 milliseconds later, but I have to be able to compress one full second of video data within one second, um, because obviously there's going to be another second of video data coming later, coming one second later. Uh, and then, of course, obviously, I'd like to preserve the integrity of the data. But we usually t use the term quality when we're talking about things like images and video. And right there, that's a sign that we're working, in a, that it's a completely different ball game when we're talking about images and video. Integrity is a pretty absolute term. Either integrity is preserved or it isn't. Now, it's true that we could talk about degrees of integrity or something, but I'll note that the word quality does have this connotation of being a sort of sliding scale. A small degradation in quality doesn't mean you have low quality. It means you have, you know, less than perfect, but still high quality. So we often use that word quality instead of integrity, one sign of the shift that we're working towards in this video. So for example, just to give you a sense of scale, one frame of 1080p video, and this video has been recorded in 1080p resolution, which as time goes by becomes less and less impressive of a claim to make because 1080p is increasingly becoming a sort of standard resolution for normal videos. Um, one frame of the video you are currently watching, if I stored that frame as an uncompressed image in RGB, would require about six megabytes. That's a ridiculous amount of data for one frame of video because if I uh, were to think about broadcast video, so this video is an example of that, um, it might use 30 frames per second. A lot of uh, videos, maybe even streaming video, uses 60 frames per second. Traditionally film, so that is movies filmed on physical film, would use 24 frames per second. And a lot of uh, digital movies will still use 24 frames per second because there's a, a certain aesthetic to 24 frame per second video that people might appreciate that gives it a certain film-like or cinematic quality. So let's suppose that we're using the smallest frame rate that people might consider acceptable for live video, which is 24 frames per second. I'm fully conscious that the frame rate could be much higher than this. With that relatively low frame rate, the amount of data I would be sending per second for 1080p video is this number. So six megabytes times 24, which is about 150 megabytes per second. That's megabytes per second. So in bits, that would be 1.1 gigabits per second. Now, I, I don't know about you, but my internet connection can't do 1.1 gigabits per second. And even if it could, even if my internet connection could manage theoretically 1.2 gigabits per second, remember that if I'm receiving data from some remote source over the internet, I'm not expecting to be able to actually achieve this level of throughput. This is the amount of throughput, if I had a 1.2 gigabit connection, that I could get between me and my internet service provider, not me and some random site on the internet. So if I think about other types of video, because you could argue, okay, fine, maybe we won't send you streaming video in 1080p format, even though, of course, you know that that's possible. Suppose we 
work our way back and say, what about low resolution video? Um, so even uh, VHS quality video, and this is a bit of a dated reference. I think the first time I taught this course in 2020, this was a dated reference. Um, so it turned long, long ago, we used to, uh, instead of having computers and YouTube and things, if we wanted to watch something twice, we would record it onto a video cassette tape. And we'd have something called a VCR that we could use to play the tape back. And the video cassette tape was this incredibly bulky plastic thing full of magnetic tape, and it would store video which, of course, was in an analog format, so it didn't have a discrete resolution. But it's generally considered that VHS quality video, the kind of thing you use to record a TV show in 1997, um, has a resolution that's effectively equivalent to about this, more or less. So 320 by 240. If you want to use a contemporary term instead of VHS quality, because I'm fully aware that many of you were born after VHS tapes were no longer really a thing, um, they still exist. You can still go buy VCRs, I think. And they, and, but but likely, many of you grew up without ever using a VHS tape, and that's just fine. Um, so you'd call this resolution 240p these days. And I, if you go take a look at the YouTube resolution selector on this video, it may well offer you the option of, of sending the video in 240p resolution. It's not going to look very nice. Um, so even video at 240p resolution, which would be what we would traditionally call VHS quality, um, and I should contrast that so many of you did grow up with DVDs, that would be 480p resolution. Um, if I use 240p resolution uncompressed, that would require 44 megabits per second. So more or less 5 megabytes, just over 5 megabytes per second. 44 megabits per second for 240p video. What I want to observe is odds are your connection right now probably couldn't sustain that. So if you're using a hardwired home internet connection, so not Wi-Fi, um, although Wi-Fi is capable of high speeds, there's more latency involved and whatever. If you are currently plugged in directly to your internet connection, and it is a home internet connection in Canada, and nobody else is currently using it, then there's a decent chance that it could be 50 megabits per second, at least theoretically. But you know, of course, that the advertised download speed of your connection isn't what you can expect in practice. So if you were receiving 44 megabits per second of video, a across a connection capable of 50 megabits, it may still not work because there might be a lot of intermediate steps between you and whoever's sending you the data. But according to the government of Canada, as of the end of last year, the end of 2022, 93.5% of Canadian households had the ability to purchase an internet connection with this download speed, a hardwired connection. Um, if you use Wi-Fi, you could get that, that download speed, maybe. But if you're using, for example, the, the UVic Wi-Fi, the University of Victoria, Wi-Fi, you are not getting that speed. And yet you are able to watch YouTube videos and evidently back in the pandemic, well, which might still be going on, frankly, you were able to uh, watch things like Zoom lectures, which are a higher resolution than this, at least I hope, um, with not too much difficulty uh, via Wi-Fi, although there were times when it was tough. So it's pretty clear that if we needed to send uncompressed video, we would be basically nowhere. There'd be no such thing as an online lecture because we would barely be able to achieve this resolution at the best of times. Okay, you, you knew all of that. Obviously, you understood that compression is a critical part of streaming video and a lot of other streaming media, so audio and images and other things like that. But it's also worth considering that the, the scale of compression that we need is pretty huge. Um, so if I can't get a compression ratio better than two out of a lossless scheme, then how in the hell am I going to try and send you 1080p video? If, I, if the best I can do is getting 1080p video down to, I don't know, 600 megabits per second, then we're still years away from being able to achieve streaming video. So it's not just that compression is definitely needed, something that I'm sure you knew before you started this course. It's that we need a huge amount of compression far beyond anything thing we could reasonably expect of the best lossless compression scheme today. And that's not to mention the fact that the best lossless compression schemes today in terms of compression performance often require a horrendous amount of computational resources, the kind of thing you wouldn't expect the average device to be able to spend decompressing um, 30 frames per second in real time. So when we have these absolute constraints, if I say, I've, I'm sorry, I've got a 5 megabit connection, or I've got a 10 megabit connection, or I've got storage media that only has space for one gigabyte of data, or I've got, I don't know, a 256 gigabyte USB flash drive, I need you to fit this video file on that USB flash drive. Sorry, I can't, I can't allocate more space. I don't have the option of the scheme failing. You need to be able to fit your data within the space limit I have set. Um, 
we can't use lossless compression. Because of the requirement that integrity comes first, lossless compression can't guarantee us that we're going to fit within any particular space requirement. Instead, we just have to hope that we're going to be lucky. And we know already that we, we have that excuse in our back pocket that schemes can fail. So we know that we're not always going to be lucky. So if lossless compression can't do our job, what do we do? If we have space constraints that lossless compression can't help us with, what do we do? And the answer is we have to start throwing data away. So we get to lossy compression. A lossy compression scheme deliberately throws bits of data away because if we throw some of our data away, our data is now smaller. And therefore, hopefully, if we then employ lossless compression, we'll get it down to a size that fits within our space requirements. Um, and so a typical lossy compression scheme uses all of the lossless techniques that we know and love after having first deleted some of the input data. And that means that we're pivoting, once we start talking about lossy compression, which is now, we're going to begin pivoting to um, not the question of, oh, how do I achieve compression? Because I think we know a lot about that already. We've just been studying compression uh, for the last two months. The question we now have is, what data do we throw away? If I'm going to throw away part of my input, what can I discard such that it will be missed the least, and ideally such that the user, the reader or whatever, the viewer or reader, whoever is experiencing this on the other end, doesn't even notice that it's gone. So if I were to delete a random character from this slide, you would agree that I have reduced the size of the data. If I chose to delete one random character, which character would you miss the least? Now we did an experiment in lecture two about this. If I were to delete all of the vowels and replace them with asterisks, you probably would still be able to read the slide. But you would definitely notice something was missing. You would, re you would understand that there's a puzzle you have to solve. You would notice that there's data that's gone and that your brain has to fill it in using its very powerful pattern matching ability. That's good. I could delete all the vowels and replace them with asterisks. That would save me some space. And I might have to do that. I might have to discard that kind of data. As long as you can still experience the salient details of the content, then the compression scheme has basically succeeded. Even if there are obvious problems with the data, obvious holes, as long as you get the point, then I guess the data is still understandable, it's still intelligible. But ideally, a good lossy compression scheme will be able to delete data that you don't even notice. So if I were to delete a random character from this slide, um, it's, it's possible I could choose one that you wouldn't notice is gone, unless you look really carefully. So one example would be if I were to delete this letter I or something. If I were to basically create a typo. A lot of times there are typos in slides. There are tons of typos in my slides. Um, and unless you stare at it, you probably don't even notice that it's there. A lot of typos just slip by. That's why they're there. That's why I don't notice them. Because your brain is so good at reading text by just bouncing through one word after the other that it doesn't notice some weird missing character unless it creates ambiguity or if it's in a really obvious place. So if I delete the word L in lossy, and I know I have a sentence beginning with a lowercase letter, for example, and also the word Aussie doesn't exist as far as I know. Um, if I delete that L, it'll be noticeable. But if I randomly delete a character from elsewhere, we might not notice it. Um, or if I delete the letter A here, that's actually deleting an entire word, but we might, we might read it as is a combination, even if it's written um, uh, without the A. And also, even if, it, if the, we notice the A weren't there, we can still make sense of the sentence. So consider that. Consider that one of our, our biggest concerns is going to pivot to not be, um, how do I achieve compression in the lossless sense? Like, do I want a symbol table? Do I want a prefix code? It's going to be, what can I do to delete parts of my data cleverly so that the person experiencing the content at the other end ideally doesn't notice? But if they do notice, um, the difference is unintrusive. Um, so, for example, here's that pair image from earlier. I have compressed this image using a lossy compression scheme. It is the JPEG scheme. We're going to use JPEG as sort of our reference point for lossy compression. We're not going to go into detail about JPEG like we did with deflate, but we are going to talk about all the techniques that go into JPEG encoding over the next few lectures. Um, JPEG has this quality parameter. I'll talk about that in a minute. The quality parameter can be set to between 0 and 100. 100 meaning try to reproduce the image as faithfully as possible at the the expense of taking up lots of space. Um, and JPEG even has a lossless mode that it can operate in. Quality setting 25 uh, per, uh, 
brings the image size down to, okay, I'll clear that, brings the image size down to 16.2 kilobytes. Its previous size, uncompressed, was 500 kilobytes. So we're now looking at a compression ratio far beyond anything I could expect to achieve losslessly. And notice how the quality is still pretty good. Um, for all of these slides, I recommend you pull the slides up separately, like open the PDF, because it's possible that when I begin talking about quality problems, YouTube's video compression, because YouTube, of course, is employing a compression technique, might be disguising some of the uh, artifacts that might be present in these. And that actually is another uh, common technique in lossy compression. If you discard data, you can add logic to your decompressor that deliberately obfuscates the obvious um, evidence of that data being discarded. So the decompressor might actually um, smear over little bits of blockiness that occur um, for you, which means you don't notice it, and if you don't notice it, why do you care? So this image has been compressed significantly with JPEG, and yet it's still pretty obvious what's going on. It's still obviously a pear hanging in a tree with a bunch of leaves around it. Um, if you stare at the image, though, you probably will notice that there's something a little bit off about it in places, and um, I'll talk about that later in more detail, but you might want to focus on these areas here. And you could observe that those are two areas that your brain probably doesn't spend much time focusing on otherwise. So notice that the scheme has been quite successful because the places where there are obvious problems are places you're not likely to look. When you look at this image, you're probably looking at the pair. And although the pair does have quality issues if you stare at it carefully, they're not too obvious at first. Once you see the original image next to this one, you'll notice them. But the scheme has done a very good job of deleting information, but cleverly hiding the information information that it's deleted, deleting only things that you're not likely to care about. So we're going to use images and video as a case study to talk about lossy compression. That's going to be the entirety of our coverage of lossy compression techniques. As usual, I'd love to cover every lossy compression technique for every media in existence, but we don't have an infinite amount of time or an infinite amount of patience. The reason why I think images and video is a good case study is, first, streaming video is a big deal. And I think if our assignment four is about streaming video, I think that it's satisfying to design a compressor and decompressor for streaming video because you know you're solving a real problem that is really difficult difficult and very common. Um, also, images and video are a great case study because, you know, my slides are visual and you are looking at them. And so it's much easier to show you an image than to try and show you quality issues with sound. Um, Audio compression is actually very interesting, of course, and many of the techniques we use for images and video can actually be applied pretty directly to audio compression, although there is certain adaptation we have to do. Um, but uh, many of the techniques we see are, they can actually be generalized, although we're going to focus on images and video exclusively. So of course, lossy compression is input specific and domain specific. So because the compression scheme is manipulating and discarding bits of the data, a lossy compression scheme for images is going to do a bunch of things that are a great deal different than a lossy compression scheme for audio. Although, as I said, some of the overarching techniques are common between all of the different lossy te uh, compression techniques you tend to see. Um, also worth observing, and something that complicates matters a bit further from our point of view in terms of what we need to know, is that most of the lossy compression schemes that we encounter in day-to-day -day life so images, video, audio, are used to compress stuff that ends up being inputs to our human sensory system. So whereas what we compress with a lossless compressor could be, you know, C code or executable files, which of course have to come out looking exact because the compiler or a, a processor doesn't have the same sense of humor and tolerance for error that humans do, um, humans are actually very good at looking at damaged data and making sense of it. Um, our sensory system is designed for us to be able to interpret and read meaning into inputs that are incomplete or, or in some way flawed. So for example, your eyes are designed, or, or your eyes have evolved over time to be able to interpret the world around you even in conditions where your eyes can't normally function. So when it's very dark or when it's foggy or when you've sustained some kind of minor injury. So if you're unable to see out of one of your eyes temporarily or permanently, the other eye is able to read quite a bit of detail into what's left over. Um, this is for a variety of different reasons, one of which, of course, is that humans have evolved over millions of years to be able to function in pretty adverse environments. Um, another one is that, obviously, 
humans have been able to survive uh, despite short-term adversities like losing vision in one eye or temporarily losing one's hearing or something and still be able to make sense of the world around them because they need to for survival. Um, and so as a result, we can leverage that in lossy compression. We can delete data from images and audio because we know the way that humans perceive images and audio. So one example coming out of audio there is we understand that if you have an audio file that appears to be a bunch of different things mixed together, so that is, this, I don't know, guitar, vocals, and bass, and drums, um, it's true that your human audio, your, your human perceptual system will consider some of those sounds more noticeable than others. Sounds that are mixed into the background, so the noise in the studio at the time the audio was recorded, isn't probably going to be missed that much if it gets removed because your human auditory system perceives louder things um, before it perceives quiet things or with higher priority. So we can leverage that. Of course, to do that, we have to either learn quite a bit about neurology and psychology and perceptual systems, or we have to bluff our way through it a little bit. And I think in this course, we're going to do a bit of bluffing. So there actually is quite a bit of a, a tie-in here between um, the way the human brain works and the way that psychology works, because a lot of, a lot of our uh, perception is psychological. That is, once I see one error uh, in my image, so once I notice any artifact in my image, I might begin looking for others. So if I can fool you just enough that you don't notice the image has an issue, you're not going to look for any of the issues that might actually be visible on closer inspection. So that, that complicates matters, but I think it's also really interesting because it allows us to relax a lot of the assumptions we were making earlier in the course. So lossy schemes are usually the combination of lossless compression schemes, especially um, you know basic fundamental techniques like Huffman coding, um, with some logic that discards information. Now broadly speaking, the lossy scheme needs some input parameter for me to tell it things like how much space should the result take up, or how much data should you throw away. And I'm going to call this thing broadly a quality parameter, with the understanding that this could just be a number, so I could say q equals 25, or the parameter could take the form of a set of numbers. So I could give it a vector that tells me that, that tells it what how to adjust quality in various different facets. Um, but we'll just call that the quality parameter. And each lossy compressor has its own way of measuring quality and its own style of quality parameter. Um, in some lossy compression schemes, uh, the quality parameter could just be a number. So let's say quality level one is the highest quality, quality level two is slightly lower, and so on. A quality parameter could also be a target size. I could tell an image compressor, hi, I want my image to fit in 500k. Maybe the best possible image that you can fit in 500k. This is pretty common for video compression because a lot of times when you're doing video compression, it is because you're about to stream video over a uh, bandwidth limited channel, whether that be via YouTube to account for the size of the, the bandwidth of your internet connection or digital video that's broadcast. Um, so for broadcast digital video, you're allocated a certain amount of bandwidth to use, a certain amount of the, of the frequency spectrum that you can use that has a certain inherent bandwidth, and you therefore need to fit your video inside a certain space. And so lossless, uh, lossy video schemes often have quality parameters that are just a size. I want to fit this video within 5 megabits per second. Do whatever you have to do to get it down to 5 megabits per second. Um, so this results in a bit of a problem because this means that uh, we, we really can't compare the result of lossy compression schemes objectively via any one metric and even really by any metric, especially with the metrics that we have available. To compare two lossless schemes, because every scheme has to play by the same rules, um, that is the output must be identical in all cases from the decompressor, it's easy to decide which lossless scheme is giving us better compression by just comparing file sizes. The problem is that when I'm allowed to throw away data, it's very easy for a lossy compression scheme to give me a small file size. What I want is the best trade-off between file size and quality, but I don't really know how to measure quality. And it's really difficult because quality is not something we could measure objectively as far as we're concerned with images and video and audio. It's a perceptual thing. It's perceived. It really, whether the image or video has high quality is a question of whether you look at the image in, or video and you get the point and you believe it has high quality. That's it. If you can um, still retain the salient details of the image and you believe the image is high quality, then it is. And so we don't really have an objective measurement. We can try and make up objective measurements, which we're going to do for lack of any better idea, but understand that we really can't judge whether a compressed image is high quality or low quality based on some number that we compute. We basically have to ask a human or a bunch of humans to look at it and say, what do you think this image, do you think this image is high quality or not? What do you think of the quality level of this image? 
So in this course, we're going to try and split the difference. Um, I'll talk in a couple of lectures about this measurement, PSNR, peak single, sig, uh, signal to noise ratio. This is a mathematical measurement of the faithfulness of a signal. So um, that is, if I compare the decompressed image to the original, the um, original input to the compressor, I can mathematically measure how far off it is uh, in terms of its quality. The problem is that doesn't take into account that human beings don't perceive quality the same way that some arbitrary mathematical signal to noise ratio measurement does. Um, so for the coming two assignments, assignments three and four, when we assess the quality of images and video, we will do it through a mixture of computing this just to have some absolute reference point and actually looking at the images. So, so multiple people will look at images and video and um, assess what they think of the quality based on analysis, analysis that a compression expert is performing. So unlike the average member of the public, we compression people um, might know a bit more about quality issues that can show up. So one outcome of this part of the course is being able to look at an image and identify the characteristic artifacts, the characteristic quality issues that get introduced by various different compression techniques, various different lossy techniques. So let's get started. Okay, but how do we start? I want to begin throwing information away from this image such that the result is ideally still looks nice and that a human viewer can still get the point. They still see this is a pear, there are some leaves, it seems to be with a background of, I guess that's the sky, there's a branch up here, and below it is some sort of blurry green area, which I guess is the grass below the tree. Um, as long as a human viewer can look at it and get those details, and that they can look at it and say, this image doesn't look obviously like it's been damaged by compression, then I guess we've succeeded. Okay, so one idea is, hey, you know, this image is a whole ton of pixels, right? There's a lot of pixels involved in a 500 by 335 image. So if I would like to uh, send you less information, let's just delete a bunch of pixels. Let's scale the image down. So what I could do is I could reduce the image to, let's, let's cut each dimension in half. So I've got 500 by 335. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to store the image with half of that resolution in both dimensions. So I've cut the resolution in half in both dimensions, which actually means the total number of pixels is now 25% of the original, because by cutting two dimensions in half, um, I'm actually reducing the number of pixels by 75%. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll send over, I'll scale the image down uniformly, and then the decompressor just scales the image back up. And here is the result of me doing that for a, a scale factor of one half. So I've used a scale factor of one half. That means I've actually reduced the size of the image by 75% because I'm, I'm only storing um, the up, uh, sort of one quarter of the number of pixels that I was storing before. Um, and if you stare at this, and again, this is an outcome we should get used to identifying, uh, uh, basically looking at these images that are purportedly the result of lossy compression and identifying artifacts. So the term artifact refers to something created by the compression process that is in some way noticeable and generally unpleasant. Although artifacts don't have to be unpleasant, but if they're recognizable, then the compression scheme um, is producing obvious evidence that it's discarded data. And we want to avoid visible artifacts as much as possible. So one outcome of this part of the course is identifying artifacts. The artifacts that I would identify in this image are related, I guess I could call them pixelation. Because I've cut down the total number of pixels by scaling the image down and then scaling it back up. When I scale the image back up, it should look like a low resolution image that was scaled up. It should have a sort of jagged appearance in some places, a pixelated appearance. And I am seeing that. Uh, I think it's most obvious in these thin structures here, the stems, especially the, the ones that reach diagonally. If you zoom in on that, you'll notice a strange sort of jagged pixelated appearance. And that's because I've scaled the image down and scaled it back up again. If I chose a different scaling mechanism, these artifacts would still be present. They might not look as jagged, but they would still be there. If I scale down by a factor of one-third, um, so scale each dimension to one-third of its previous value, um, then I'm actually reducing the number of pixels I'm storing by 89%. So I've now discarded almost 90% of the data of the original image. But if I zoom in on this, it looks very pixelated. So again, look at this, these um, stems of leaves uh, in the foreground. They're, they're still present, but there's something very wrong with them. They're being pixelated because the pixels involved have been merged with some of the pixels behind them, the pixels for the sky. There are filtering techniques that could make that can minimize the impact of this, but it would still be visible. There would still be something wrong with those stems. And similarly, the edges of leaves and the edges 
of the pair are very jagged looking and pixelated. Now you might say, well, wait, the jaggedness is something we might be able to avoid. If the decompressor is allowed to apply um, filters to fool you, why not do something um, in the decompressor to sort of anti-alias the image? And we could do that. So for example, the decompressor could apply a blur once compression, decompression is complete. So we're still sending this image. This is all we're sending to the decompressor. But the decompressor is allowed to, to play a little shell game um, to manipulate the image to make the artifacts less noticeable. But generally what you're doing is trading one form of quality loss for another. So here the decompressor has applied a blur filter. Now you could argue this might be too much of a blur filter. That's a fair argument. And you'll notice that um, the pixelation is gone. By applying the blur, I've sort of sanded down all of the rough edges. I've smoothed them over or I've smeared them together. However, if I stare at it, I'll notice that this looks blurry. I mean, a human viewer stares at this and says, this looks like an out of focus image. Because the original image wasn't out of focus, that means we have noticeable compression artifacts. So the blur, the, the global blur is now an artifact. It's not as noticeable an artifact, but it is still an artifact because a human viewer is missing one of the salient details of the original image, the fact that the pair was in focus. Here, it's possible the original image was out of focus and it's hard to tell because the artifact has created this ambiguity. So of course, this is a solution to pixelation, but notice how it doesn't solve the overarching problem of there being data missing. And although we are allowed to do this, we're allowed to have the decompressor manipulate the image. Keep in mind that often all you're doing is trading one form of quality loss for another. Um, so of course, I've removed 90% of the image, so I shouldn't be too surprised that I have to lose some of the data. The trick is finding um, data to delete where a human viewer won't notice it. Again, the gold standard is deleting data in such a clever way that a human viewer doesn't even notice anything's missing. If they don't notice that anything's missing, they won't go looking for artifacts. If they don't go looking, they're not going to find them. So the visible pixelation I had here is very noticeable to human eyes. Um, this is for a few different reasons. Um, so I would, and I, I've, I've read up on this to some extent, although I'm not going to claim that I'm an expert on perceptual aspects beyond what I need to know for this compression course. One thing I will observe is that if we think about the evolution of the human visual system, where in nature do we see this? really? Where in nature do we see blockiness or pixelation? If I think about blocky structures that exist in nature, I think about certain forms of crystals, which, you know, humans don't have to worry about that often, crystals that are squared off. Um, as far as human evolution is concerned, we've interacted with crystals for millions of years, but not in a survival setting generally. Um, we see crystals under the microscope, but humans didn't have microscopes until only a few hundred years ago. We see blockiness in human-created things, so human artifacts, human structures are often blocky looking, but in nature we don't tend to see that. So it shouldn't surprise us that our eyes are drawn to this sort of feature as looking very unnatural. It doesn't look like something we would tend, it doesn't look very organic. And that's why it stands out especially in the context of organic imagery like a pear and leaves. Um, so abrupt boundaries are something the human eye is very good at distinguishing. And that's one reason why artifacts that create abrupt boundaries are very noticeable. Um, the blur uh, doesn't solve the problem, but on the other hand, you look at this and if this weren't a compression course, you'd say, oh, it's a blurry image of a pair. That could be taken by a camera that was out of focus. Not necessarily, this is the result of a compression technique screwing up my data. So keep that in mind. The human visual system can certainly see that this is blurry, but because blurriness is a more organic thing, I mean, your eyes, at any given time, there are a lot of the things you could be looking at are blurry because your eyes are focused on only one thing that you're looking at. Uh, and in general, if you go stand out, look out the window, so find a window and look out the window. If you focus on something in it that's, you know, 20 or, or 30 meters away, anything that's closer or further away will appear blurry. So blurriness is a much more organic thing than pixelation. Uh, okay, so another example, another example of a technique we could use to delete data. Instead of reducing the numbers of number of pixels, let's see if we can reduce the number of bits I use to represent each pixel. So remember that at the moment, if we store this image uh, in RGB with eight bits per channel, each pixel is 24 bits. So eight bits for red, eight bits for green, eight bits for blue. Now in the next lecture, I'm gonna talk about this in, in more detail that there's actually quite a bit of nuance to this because it turns out that our visual system has a bias, a, a, very, a, a very strong bias for green. We're very good at distinguishing different shades of green, which shouldn't surprise us because from an evolutionary standpoint, humans have often had 
had to distinguish between different kinds of plants, and generally speaking, plants are green. Whereas our visual system isn't as good at differentiating shades of red or blue, because although we do see reds and blues in the world, unlike for survival reasons having to dif distinguish different kinds of plants, we don't need that much as much detail for red and blue that we do for green. I'm going to come back to that in the next lecture. For this lecture, I'm not going to worry about the bias between red, green, and blue. Instead, I'll talk about it uniformly. So if I use 8 bits per color, that's 24 bits per pixel. Now, if this image were grayscale, so no colors, I could just use 8 bits per pixel, I guess. And that, that would be, most people would still perceive that as a high quality image. And that leads us to believe maybe that if 8 bits per pixel in grayscale is sufficient, I don't actually need more than 255 possible levels as far as um, the amount of detail I want, although whether the colors look natural or not is a different question. So one idea would be just use fewer than 8 bits per color channel, because that would obviously save. If I use 4 bits per color channel, I've just cut the size of the image in half. Um, so the number of possible colors I get with 8 bits per channel is 16 million, so 2 to the 24. And one observation I can make is that this image doesn't actually have 16 million pixels. It has this number of pixels which is not going to be 16 million. So I don't need 16 million colors in this image in any event. Um, and I could argue that I, I may not need 16 million colors in a general sense. And if I do need them, it would only be for certain types of images. Um, one thing I'll come back to in a few minutes is the fact that this image is very heavily biased towards shades of green. There are lots of shades of blue and shades of red that will never appear in this image, a huge number of them, because the image is so full of different greens. Um, and so I'm sort of wasting uh, the very, I have a huge selection of colors available and I'm wasting that selection because I'm not using all of it. Okay, so one question is how many distinct colors do I need for this image to look realistic? And I'm going to spend much of the remainder of this lecture exploring that in various ways. So I could just try using two bits per color channel. And remember that if I use two bits per color channel, what I'm saying is that for each of red, green, and blue, my options are either 0, 1, 2, or 3. So either fully red or no red at all. Or if you have a little bit of red, you get two options. So 25%, I guess, I don't know, 33% red and 66% red. Um, and of course, that is going to reduce the number of available options really significantly. And it's especially difficult in an image like this um, because I have lots of shades of green to represent, but I only have four options for green. Green. So things are either 100% green, 66% green, 33% green, or they're not green. And so if I use two bits per channel, I get a very noticeable reduction in quality. And, and the image, the salience of the image has been lost. You could look at this and say, is this some sort of artistic attempt at rendering a photograph of a pair, or is it a painting or something? Um, what have you done to this? It's clearly not the original image. Uh, and it's not even, there are aspects of it that make it look even like I've deliberately manipulated it for artistic purposes. One thing I'll call your attention to is, um, whereas the scaling earlier produced pixelation as its characteristic artifact, here I have the same number of pixels, but I have um, compacted the color space. And one artifact we'll notice that's characteristic of um, color space reduction is this banding effect. So notice how this, the pair previously, didn't contain any, any boundaries between particular colors. Although as we work our way downwards in the picture, it gets darker because there's let the light I guess is shining on it from above. When we look at the compressed result, notice how we've got these very uh, sort of obvious regions of particular colors separated by very abrupt boundaries, so bands of color. That's because I only have a certain number of shades available, um, and therefore I have to switch between them sort of abruptly. Um, We'll see near the end of this lecture a couple of ways around that, but in general, that's very noticeable to human eyes because in nature, we don't tend to have as abrupt, uh, or that does occur, but not nearly as often um, as, it would, as it would imply from this image. Here's another image that has a much wider variety of colors present, and if we reduce this to two bits per channel, keeping in mind that there are now only 64 different values that I could set each pixel to, if I reduce this to two bits per channel, I end up with a lot of very, again, this effect looks almost like it's deliberate and artistic. It doesn't look like I'm attempting to reproduce a photograph here. Notice how I've got a bunch of banding artifacts. I can see them most visibly on this slice of pineapple here, uh, where I want to transition between a very large number of shades of sort of yellowish, whereas I only have a few yellows available when I'm done, so I end up having to break that into discrete regions with obvious um, boundaries between them. I also notice banding artifacts showing up here. That's really nasty because 
this is no longer distinguishable. It's no longer clear what this is supposed to be. It apparently is also this piece. It's another piece of pineapple. Um, so I've also got the kiwi here now has banding. If I look carefully, so there's some bands there. There's also some there. Um, there is some weird looking banding happening in the background. It's quite unpleasant. Notice how the shades of the background here, this could be like the tablecloth behind the fruit salad. Um, in my result, I get this really ugly brownish thing happening because I don't have any colors that are close to the colors that I want to use here. So I get this banding artifact from color space compression. Um, just to show my work, the way I performed this is I just took each color value and I, I rounded it off to a value between 0 and 3. So I just divided it by, I just re reduced the size of the color space and divided it by 3. Um, so uh, in, in cases uh, where um, I'm converting between uh, using a particular number of bits per channel. So as opposed to like a certain number of possibilities per channel, so 256 versus 16 or versus four or something, if I'm going for eight bits from eight bits down to two, I can just use bit shifting. I can just chop off less significant bits. Or I could do some kind of rounding. Rounding might have helped this to some extent, um, but I can use bit shifting, which makes it a very attractive technique from a performance standpoint. Um, okay, so two bits per channel is a bit excessive. Suppose I use four bits per channel. So four bits versus eight means I've now cut the size of the image in half, which is pretty good. Um, and uh, if I use four bits per channel, now each pixel is going to have 12 bits, which means I've got 4,096 possible combinations. Um, although they are distributed very specifically between the three different color channels, because I have four bits per channel. Um, and notice how in the image I end up with, I actually have something that looks pretty good. Uh, I would argue that if you don't know this is a compression exercise and you glance at this for a few seconds, it looks pretty good. There, there isn't any obvious issue with quality. However, there are visible artifacts. Um, so I've got the image in closer up detail here, just so we can see it larger in the video. As I said, open the slides separately and take a look. The pair doesn't have any visible banding artifacts. I don't see anything visible, at least from the resolution I'm seeing at uh, creating this video, um, nor do I see any pixelation. However, I do see something strange happening down on the ground. And because that's an area of the image where you're not likely to focus too much, you might not have noticed that until now. And you might not go looking for that because in general, when you glance at an image, you probably look at the foreground of it. Um, there's also something very odd happening back here. Um, and the, if you zoom in on this, there's a strange pattern um, forming in the sky. It's unclear exactly what that pattern is caused by. I have a feeling I wouldn't read too much into the specific pattern there. I would observe, though, that there is a strange artifact happening. There are two different colors that mingle in a strange way. Um, the reason why the pattern has the particular characteristics that it does, it almost looks like a circuit board or something, has to do either with what, what happened to this image before I got it. So it turns out, spoiler alert, this image of a pair um, that I'm presenting as if it were uncompressed was actually aggregated from a much larger lossily compressed image that I got off of the internet. Um, it also could be a remnant left over from the way the image was created, so the camera that took the image. But in any event, with four bits per channel, I no longer have the obvious quality drop that I had before. I would argue that the salient details of the image are being preserved. Somebody who looks at this can get the same impact as they would with the original image. However, there are still visible artifacts. They may not be obvious, but they are they're obvious enough that if you stare at the image long enough, you will see them. Um, if I use four bits per channel on my fruit salad, um, it is there are still pretty obvious artifacts. So that piece of pineapple is a pretty, is, I think, the most obvious place. This other piece, it's strange how it's affecting the yellows more than everything else. There is some banding visible on this, I guess this is melon back here. Um, and I can see a bit of banding on the tablecloth in the background in a few places. Um, but I would still argue that although the artifacts are visible, a human viewer gets what they need to out of this image. They're able to understand the content of the image. So while I want to eliminate the artifact, I think that with four bits per channel, I am able to achieve at least that lower bound of a human looks at the image gets the same impact they would out of the original image. And if they notice the artifacts, they'll probably say, yeah, I, I've seen a lot of digital images in my life. I have a feeling that's a problem with the compression technique, not, with, not an artistic choice made as part of producing the image. Um, so we call this process of reducing the options for colors, color quantization. Uh, and the term quantization comes, from, comes to us from in the same vein as we would use it in signal processing. Uh, and you'll notice a lot of similarities between image compression and video compression and signal processing, and that, that is deliberate. They actually have a lot of common heritage. 
So here's, oh, I should have drawn my picture on this. So you can see here are the artifacts on the pieces of pineapple. There's a little bit of banding visible there on the melon. Um, I can see some, there's something strange happening on the edge of this piece of kiwi. It is an artifact, so there is banding happening, although you, you would have to be looking for banding to observe that that's a banding artifact there. There's also banding happening here and in this, in, on these background pixels. Um, so this kind of reduction, where I just reduce the number of colors available per channel, this is called scalar quantization. So I basically choose a multiplier, or you could call it a divisor, and I reduce the color space in each channel by that size. So I go from having 256 possibilities for each channel to having 16. So it's scalar quantization. And that can be a bit wasteful because um, we know that our images can have characteristics, can have a, a color scheme that is characteristic of the image. This image has a pretty wide distribution of colors, but notice there aren't any blues. There are blueberries, which have a sort of purpley color, but there aren't any bright blues in here. Um, whereas the image of a pear is very heavy on greens. Um, and so we, the scalar quantization just reduces the color space independent of the characteristics of the image, which means if there were wide swaths of my color space that I wasn't using in my input image, there are still parts of the color space reserved for those colors in my output image because I haven't done my, my quantization relative to the colors that actually appear in the image. So that's pretty much the biggest downside of scalar quantization. The set of possible colors is still evenly spaced throughout the color system. So there was a color for bright blue available in this image, so 00255. And if I use four bits per channel, I still have an option for bright blue, 0015. The problem is I don't see bright blue, so why do I need a color for that? Why am I wasting one of my possible color options um, on a color that doesn't exist? This is really a, an interpretation of a thing we saw in lossless compression of why do you want to encode a symbol that never appears in your input? If a symbol never appears, why bother giving it an encoding? It's sort of the same issue. So we know already that there's overhead associated with only using a certain symbol set. So if symbol 173 doesn't appear, I don't have to give it an encoding, but I then have to tell the decompressor that I'm not going to encode it, but maybe it's worth it. So one other option we could use is um, design a reference set of colors to use as a to just reducing the set of available colors uniformly, let's choose a set of colors that we think best represents the colors that actually appear in the image and use those. Um, so if I go to the two bits per channel thing, again, one of the reasons why this looks so ugly is, I mean, two bits per channel isn't very many, but 64 possible colors, if they were chosen better, might result in a better uh, quality image. If I have more greens, I have lots of shades of greens in my input. If I had lots of shades of greens available in my output, maybe the image would look better. It might still look bad, but it would probably look a lot better. Um, so the next idea is, how about this? Let's look at our image, choose a small palette of representative colors. So let's say 64 or 256 possible colors, and then go through the image and for each pixel, find the closest um, color among our representative palette and use that. So this is called, among other things, we could call this vector quantization. We could call this palletization. So vector quantization, the reason it's called vector quantization is um, I'm now treating each pixel as a color vector. So I don't know, here's, let's do bright blue again. And uh, I am then, if I have a pixel that has a similar value, so if this is my representative, if it's if, if among my representative colors I've got bright blue, and I encounter a pixel with this, what I'm doing is computing the distance between this vector and this vector, and in general between each color, each pixel's color and all the representatives. And the representative I choose for the pixel is the one which with the shortest Euclidean distance or some other distance metric from each pixel's color. So if I were to create a set of 64 representative colors, um, then each pixel could be stored as an index. So that means that what I'm doing ultimately consumes the same amount of space as if I just use two bits per channel. If I use two bits per channel, each pixel is being stored in six bits, so there are 64 possibilities. So if I use vector quantization and I choose, I intelligently choose 64 representatives, I'm gonna store the image with the same amount of data as I would if I just use two bits per channel. The hope is if I make my choice intelligently, that I can have more shades available that are close to shades that appear in the image. Okay, so here's one idea. It's a really bad idea, but we'll show it off. We have to, have, we have to start somewhere. Our first try. Let's choose the 64 most popular colors. 
So the most frequently occurring colors. This is the most, the most popular colors. So you think we could call this the popularity algorithm. Well, no, because somebody else in some alternate universe recording this video said, let's choose the 64 most populous colors. So they called it the populosity algorithm. And although I find that word oddly satisfying to say, it also sounds sort of ridiculous. But there it is. It also looks sort of ridiculous. So I suppose after all this time, maybe the name is fitting after all. If I choose the 64 most popular colors, I end up with a pretty huge problem with bias, which is that, okay, what colors appear most frequently in this image? Well, obviously the pear is full of the, these colors of a sort of medium green. The problem is, the same particular medium green might not appear very many times. There are a bunch of sort of brighter greens, a few, you know, middling greens, some darker greens, but each individual color might only appear for a few pixels. On the other hand, down here on the ground in the blurry background region, I'm probably seeing a particular shade of dark green show up a lot a shade of dark green like, you know, that one. And so if I rank colors by how many, how often they appear, I'm gonna end up subject to biases where there are certain colors that appear a lot in an absolute sense, but don't really represent the image. Similarly, this background area, might wash out to white. So even though, you know, this could have a lot of definition, it might be a very small number of different uh, of colors, shades of very bright colors. And so if I look at the most popular colors that appear, I might just get a full washed out white or similarly a, wa a completely washed out black. And so if I choose the most populous or popular colors, I'm going to be subject to those biases and get something that looks really stupid, which is what this, that's my professional opinion. This image looks stupid. We need to try again. Okay, there, yeah, there it is. It's still, in, in, in larger size, it looks even more stupid. Um, okay, so, and then over here, here's the fruit salad. Notice how, because of some unfortunate attributes of the image, because of the large number of different colors appearing on all the colored regions, the most popular colors tend to be from weird parts of the image, like the places, the darkest parts of the blueberry or the tablecloth in the background. So when I look at the most popular colors and I convert the image to only using those, I get something that doesn't even have any colors in it as far as I can distinguish. It's got this bizarre sort of lightish blue color and everything else is sort of washed out to white or black. So this is nasty. We don't want to use this, but we have to have a first try. Oh, there it is again. Um, so the uh, besides, yeah, besides the name, which I consider to be another problem with the populosity algorithm, the issue is that the most popular colors could all appear in the same area of my color space. So, I mean, ideally we can think of, well, let's just draw the red versus green axes here. We can think of our color space, um, so there's zero, and then red can go up to 255, so there's my red axis, and here's my green axis here, and it goes up to 255. If I look at pixels red and green values, they might be distributed all over over the place. But there could be a cluster somewhere with the most popular colors in it. That doesn't necessarily mean that these colors are close to the ones that I choose from my popular cluster. Um, and that's the problem with the populosity algorithm. Uh, so, of course, it's no, no surprise that green and white are popular. The problem is these particular shades of green and white are not good representatives for the rest of the image. Okay, so the second try is to be a little bit more careful. How about we partition our color space into regions where every pixel is um, representative ideally more or less equally. So my idea is if I plot the different colors that I see and I want to choose a small number of representatives for each pixel because I know that I can't have this number of colors, it's too many, what I want to do is choose a representatives that are magnanimous enough that every pixel gets a representative that's sort of nearby. By. Maybe not as close as some other pixels representatives are, but sort of nearby. So what I, well, what I could try doing is divide the space of colors up and just cut it in half at each step. So I cut this space in half, and then there are the same number of pixels on each side of the line. I then cut the result in half again, so that there are still the same number of pixels on each side of the line. And I keep dividing it up over and over again until I've divided it into enough pieces that I have one piece for each representative. So I could divide it, let's do, let's do it maybe a few more times. And over time, I'll have one little box of my color space um, for each group of pixels, and I choose one representative per box. Maybe I average out all of the colors um, in the box to get a representative. Um, 
we could an algorithm to do this is called the median cut algorithm. And notice how here I have chosen 64 representative colors with the median cut algorithm. Now you're likely not going to need to implement this algorithm, which is why my description is at a pretty high level. But um, because if you need it for assignment four, you're welcome to go use an implementation of it. Uh, with assignment four, you'll find yourself often putting together pre-existing pieces. Um, but the median cut algorithm chooses representatives by trying to give each pixel a representative as more magnanimously than just choosing the popular ones globally. Instead, it tries to divide the color space up into chunks and then create one representative per chunk. This is 64 colors with the median cut algorithm, and it looks really good. There aren't even that many artifacts in the background. There is some banding present on the pair because the pair contained quite a bit of detail, but in general, the salience is preserved. A human looking at this would see something broadly pretty similar to the original image. There are still problems. There is certainly some weird banding happening there and in the background in various places. Um, there probably is a bit of banding happening in the dark region, but I can't see it very well, so because we rely on human perception, I won't count that. Uh, but in general, the image looks really good, especially given that I went from 16 million possible colors down to, six, uh, down to only 64 of them. <clears throat> So just, just to give a quick summary, the median cut algorithm recursively divides the color space into boxes, um, and it does this along axial lines. So you can think of them as horizontal or vertical, keeping in mind, though, that the actual color space is sort of a, it, it's a, a cube. Um, so it looks sort of like, like that. Um, and it divides it into boxes, and the idea is each time we split um, one of our boxes, we divide it up so that there are the same number of pixels in each box, more or less. Uh, and that way, if we have we end up with, um, if I want to make k boxes, if I want to choose k representatives, I end up with k boxes, each with approximately the same number of pixels, that all have relatively similar colors, and then those pixels get a representative that's close to them. And that means that I choose representatives that represent the full range of colors present in the image. I still have rounding errors, I still have banding that shows up, because I have more colors in my original image than I do in my output. Um, so yeah, to find k representatives, in this case I'd want 64 of them, I just divide things up until there are k boxes formed, and they're all of equal size. And then I, chose, I choose representatives by just taking the average the, of all the pixels in the box. Um, now, if I reduce this image down to 16 colors, of course I end up with a, a, a bit of a mess. I will observe that it's still way better than if I use 2 bits per channel. Um, so 2 bits per channel would give me um, 12 bits per pixel. Here I'm using 4 bits per pixel and I'm getting a better result. I'm not preserving salience because at this point it's not clear what the original color of the pair was. This is it, the, the color is pretty far away from the original color. Um, a human looking at this might think this was an artistic change, but maybe they wouldn't. There's some salience preserved, but I don't think all of it. Um, if I compare 2 bits per channel to 64 colors with median cut, the difference is pretty stark. I mean, this this is a mess. We saw this earlier. This is pretty good. It's got some issues, but I think salience is broadly preserved. Um, in the fruit salad image, uh, it's not. I, I don't have as good news to to share because um, 2 bits per channel, recall that the issue with 2 bits per channel is there are still all these shades of reds and blues that I wasn't using in my pair image. I, what I wanted in my pair image was lots of shades of green. Whereas in the fruit salad image, I do actually want lots of shades of red and some blue and some yellow and lots of uh, greens as well. Um, and so the difference is a little bit less stark. I still think that median cut does a better job because it's able to choose representatives more carefully but I still have a bit of a mess. Still have some banding happening there and there and on the edge of the kiwi to some extent and here and oh, I already saw, said that. I've got that. I've got this stuff in the background still happening. However, it, I think it's still a pretty notable step up. Although the colors are still a bit messed up, notice that the, the color space problem, so having so few colors, the compression of the color space in the two bits per channel version was severe enough that it actually affects the ability, like detail level of the image, not just the colors being banded together, but I actually can't tell what this really is. I can, I can sort of infer it's a kiwi, but I can't really figure out what, what the shape of the slice is. Here, I retain that definition. The colors are a bit washed out. I see some banding, but I do know what the shape of the slice of kiwi actually looks like. Uh, okay, so yeah, there it is. I, should, I, I need to draw on the larger, higher resolution version. Um, okay, so uh, the most noticeable artifact, as I'm sure you've already observed, is banding. So whenever we're limiting the number of colors available uh, in an image with a large number of colors going down to a small number of colors, the most notable artif noticeable artifact tends to be color banding. Now the decompressor could try to conceal this. The decompressor could employ some kind of um, selective blur filter to try and smooth over the boundary. 
However, that, that wouldn't really remove the effect because there would still be this region of a solid color and this other region of a solid color. The boundary would be less obvious. It would be a sort of gradual fade, but you still have effectively color banding happening. Um, and uh, when we have situations where the colors are tightly clustered, um, we don't need as many representatives because we just need enough representatives to um, ameliorate the effect of the banding artifact in areas with color gradients. We actually don't mind there being abrupt color transitions in parts of the image where those actually exist. So of course, I don't mind there being an abrupt boundary here along the bottom of the pair because there is an abrupt boundary there. Um, what I care about are when I have a continuous gradient, that turning into a discrete gradient that turning into a set of color bands. And as I said earlier, although this does exhibit banding, it's actually pretty visually pleasing. If I go to a palette of 256 representatives, so I'm now using 8 bits per pixel instead of 24, I get a really nice image. I, I really would struggle to find any uh, color compression artifacts on the pair or in the, uh, the green area in the background. I do see color banding showing up in the image though, although I would argue that if you're not looking for it, you wouldn't find it. Um, it it's really unlikely you catch a glimpse of the rare examples of banding artifacts in this image because they are in parts of the the image that you don't really care about, that your brain isn't going to focus in on. Um, it turns out that this format here, which I'll talk about later, um, actually requires images to have um, a 256 colors. It requires palletization. Um, it is actually, a, I'll talk about it, but it's a lossless format. But arguably turning a photo um, into a palletized representation is essentially a lossy transformation. Oh, by the way, yeah, that's right. This format actually stands for graphics interchange format. Mm, format. So it's one of those again. Uh, so there's our 256 color um, uh, version of the pair. So there are the places I highlighted uh, the instances of banding before. So like I see some banding there. I see some up there. I don't see much else. Um, I see something funny happening there. Maybe there's, this maybe counts. Um, but I would argue that you're not going to look at any of those areas of the image at a glance. Um, if you just saw this image in the wild, you probably wouldn't zoom in on it to look for banding artifacts. And therefore, you probably wouldn't notice that this image has been quantized down to 256 colors, which I think is a sign that the median cut algorithm is doing a really good job. Um, so just a reminder, uh, just so that we can recontextualize the amount of storage we need. Um, if I'm storing a palletized image with this number of colors, so, so at this point I'm assuming we're going to choose the number of colors to be a power of two so that I can just use a certain number of bits per pixel. Well, to store that, what I would need is um, this number of uh, bytes, so just to store the actual pixels. So each pixel is stored in B over 8 bytes, um, obviously, because it's B bits per pixel. Uh, and then I'd also need this. So I actually have to store the palette. I mean, if I'm going to store a palletized image, I have to tell you what the palette is, unless I'm sending you 24-bit values for each pixel, which makes no sense. Um, so what I would probably do is send you, I guess, a table of colors. So color number zero is, I don't know, let's make it bright green. And then color number one is whatever this is. And so I have to send you that. This is sort of the analog of sending over a symbol table. This becomes overhead. So keep in mind, it's not, it's not sufficient just to reduce the number of colors. I'll have to tell the decompressor what my colors are. I'll have to give it the palette. On the other hand, the, the number of colors I send um, is a, a function of how many representatives I'm choosing, not the size of the image. So as the size of the image goes gets larger and larger, and I use the same number of representatives, the table size doesn't go up. But on the other hand, if my image is huge, then I might want more representatives because it might contain a greater diversity of colors. So it's always a trade-off. Um, so here's this with 16 colors with a median cut algorithm. Um, it doesn't look very good. It, it, looks, it looks pretty bad. Um, here's 256 colors with a median cut algorithm. I'll show the larger version in a minute. Um, this comes out if I, if I store it with this set of representatives um, and I use a very basic representation of my palette table, keeping in mind that I would then probably feed this into lossless compression. I might want to compress that, compress that palette table as well. If I were to store the palette table in some sort of representation or something, I might be able to use delta compression on it. Um, but it takes about 500K for this 800 by 600 image. Um, and so we'll take a look at that in greater detail. This is the fruit salad with 256 colors. Although there are artifacts visible, so again here, this one piece of pineapple is just the bane of our existence. Um, and then on this other thing, um, and some on the kiwi, I believe salience is preserved. I believe you can look at this, and it, it's a bit borderline, but I believe you can look at this and say, that's, that's a fruit salad. And here's some pomegranate arrows, there's a kiwi, there's a pineapple. 
I don't know, that's watermelon. Um, but yeah, it's borderline. They're, they're visible artifacts. But unlike this thing, which it's unclear what's going on here, there's just some sort of weird sepia-toned experiment, it is pretty clear what the original image was and that the viewer can, can sort of understand what's underneath all of those artifacts. Um, if I were to store this image in RGB, it would be about 1.4 megabytes. So with this modification, with visible artifacts, I get it down to about a third of its original size. Um, okay, now let's talk about some image formats. For the rest of this lecture, I'm going to talk about lossless image formats. We'll start talking about um, lossy techniques um, at, a, at a greater scale in the next lecture, which is a bit of a breather lecture. And then two lectures from now, we'll talk about the core transformation performed in the JPEG scheme. So there's this format, which is pronounced GIF. The GIF image format, it is a lossless image format, just, to, just so you can get, um, get, get your story straight. Remember that there is, if you say GIF, that is apparently a brand of peanut butter. And I hope that if I say that in videos enough, they will start paying me for product placement. Um, and I, I, think I'm, I think that might be a conflict of, in, I'll have to look into whether that's a conflict of interest. But anyway, it turns out that the image format is pronounced GIF, GIF like the word gift. And it's, there are certainly no words beginning with G where G isn't pronounced as G, so of course it's going to be GIF. Um, the, the peanut butter company made up a novelty jar of GIF peanut butter a few years ago, and I like the image, so I'm going to keep it. I think I'll use it as a thumbnail for the video again. Um, okay, so among other things, if you, I'm not really a peanut butter person, but um, the, this type of peanut butter is is pronounced GIF, and among the other differences between GIF and GIF, well, GIF is an image compression scheme, and GIF is pronounced with the, the hard G sound. Okay, so now we've gotten past that. Um, in a GIF image, which is actually a losslessly compressed image, the image must have a fixed palette of 256 colors. So what this means in practice is that if you're compressing an image with 256 possible colors, GIF is always lossless. However, if you try to compress something that contains more than 256 colors, you have to first reduce it to contain 256 colors, which requires, of course, a lossy transformation. Um, Internally, GIF is, images are stored as a bunch of 8-bit indices, as you'd expect. Um, the array of indices is encoded with LZW, and that should tell you quite a bit about the generation of compression schemes to which GIF belongs. Um, it is from the late 1980s or early 90s. I guess like 1989 was the original GIF, the, the standardized version of it. Um, and that was back during the heyday of LZW, which fell out of favor due to patent issues. Um, and it turns out that GIF images do support the ability to have one big image and divide it up into pieces and have a separate palette for each of them. So you could actually have in aggregate a GIF image with more than 256 colors where each of the different chunks has its own 256 color palette. But in general, the palette is pretty limited. The number of colors that might appear in an arbitrary photograph could be massive. So storing that as a GIF image would require some lossy transformation, although that isn't really the end of the world. But that said, we don't typically use GIF images to store photographs. Um, so yeah, just to make it clear, GIF is actually a lossless format, but to, to actually store certain things in GIF, you have to lossly compress them, lossly transform them. Um, what's interesting about the GIF format, the reason why we still care about it today, so really, it, it, as far as still images go, GIF is an obsolete format. It has some neat advantages. There are certain images that GIF can store in less space than other formats, but that's just a coincidence, I guess. Like, that's just luck. Um, it's similar to how Deflate uh, sometimes outperforms LZMA. Um, the reason GIF is still relevant is because it is a still image format that supports animation. And a lot of people still want to produce animated GIF images to post on the internet. Um, and as a result, there are a bunch of modern tools that leverage techniques that have come into being since the late 1980s to make really high quality GIF images from photos. So you, you can actually create animations or animated GIF images that look like video files. Uh, but that said, if we want to post animated data these days, if you want to create animations, um, it might seem odd that GIF is the most popular format for animated images. The reason is because if you want to encode animation these days, you typically just use video. Like you just create a video file. So you might use a streaming video file or HTML5 video to store an animation now. And if you insist on, on storing it as a still image, then you would use the GIF format. Over the years, there have been other attempts at standardizing some animated still image format. So there was this, for example. This is one of many attempts at this. PNG is a popular format that we'll talk about in a minute. There was It, it had an associated um, animated format that nobody ever seemed to care about, unfortunately. Um, and GIF, therefore, continues to reign as the dominant 
dominant still image animation format. But these days, if you, generally speaking, that's because animations are typically broadcast via video files, because video compression is much more powerful than still image compression in a lot of ways, or via procedural logic. So you could have vector animations inside of SVG, or you could produce them with JavaScript or something. Um, in a GIF image, so one of the advanced techniques used to try and uh, mitigate the effects of palletization in GIF images is a technique called dithering. Um, and this has been around forever. So I remember my first experiences with the internet in the mid-1990s as a kid, um, tr learning about things like animated GIF images, which of course fascinated me, and trying to find how I could make my own animations, like I want to draw my own animations, and discovering how difficult it was to, go to, to actually obtain a, a GIF compressor, a, a program that would generate GIF images. And the reason was because at that time, nobody wanted to publish such a thing without making you pay for it because they were worried about being sued. You could buy such a piece of software because because they could then pay the royalties, but there weren't free ones. Um, and even then, when you, when you did buy a piece of software and or if you found some version elsewhere in some primitive version of piracy, um, you would, uh, they would often have this feature built in. This is actually not a very recent innovation. Um, it's something called dithering. And the idea basically is because the characteristic artifact of um, uh, color palletization tends to be color banding. So you have these, this band of color and the, the obvious transition uh, is visible to your eye. One way of avoiding that is, I, I mentioned earlier, sort of a blur filter, um, but another way of avoiding it would be to uh, try and um, obfuscate the boundary by instead having there be a transition by using sort of dots of that color. So instead of just having there be a place where suddenly all the pixels are one color and, and then on the other side of the line all the pixels are another, make it a more gradual transition by having tiny little dots of each color show up on both sides of the line. Um, and you can see you get an effect similar to half toning, um, which would be the kind of thing you'd see in old newspaper images if you take a look at that. And it is actually quite a pleasant, um, it is quite a, a pleasant technique. If you look at it, you can see there's something weird going on, but it's not as it doesn't jump out at you as much as the color banding. So that's called dithering. That's something you're not going to need to do, but it's neat to observe. This is an example of a compensation technique used to work around obvious artifacts. So the key with lossy compression is to push around the artifacts into places where you're either not going to notice them or where you're not going to care that you see them, where they look sort of nice. They have they have an interesting quality to them that reminds you of, let's say, printed images or something. And so dithering is one example of that. Uh, and so there's the quantized version to 32 colors, and there's the dithered version. And notice how the boundary between um, different color bands has instead become this strange sort of matrix of dots. Uh, and it shows up elsewhere too. It creates a peculiar sort of stained glass effect on the background, and it does create a weird artifact artifacting effect in areas of the background that had a lot of color banding. But on the foreground, it does a pretty good job. It creates a sort of staticky effect here though. That's a bit unpleasant. Um, and then here is the fruit salad, the 32 colors, which looks like a mess. Here it is dithered. So this is only going to have 32 colors in it. And it, it looks pretty good. With only 32 colors, the dithering, for example, I mentioned earlier that this slice of kiwi, it's hard to tell what the shape is. With the dithering, you can tell again. It's a little bit blurry, but because the dithering isn't a blur filter, dithering creates an artificial sense of sharpness. And so although really you've created a sort of macroscopic, from a high level, almost a blur effect, to the the human eye, it doesn't look like you've blurred it. And it does do a pretty good job of eliminating all those color bands. You can still see some banding here and a little bit of banding there, but a lot of other banding, so here, here, and on the keyway, has been pretty effectively eliminated. So dithering does a pretty good job of that. And again, dithering is only there to ameliorate the artifact. It's only there to cover up an artifact created by the actual compression, which is um, the color banding created by color quantization. Uh, and so we're seeing already in lossy compression the same logic we've seen in lossless compression of stacking techniques. In lossless compression, we would sometimes combine a compression technique with a transformation. So for example, BWT and RLE. Here, we find ourselves combining a compression technique like color quantization with a cover-up strategy like dithering. Um, okay, so we, we to compress in GIF format, we first palletize the image, and then we've got this 8-bit um, array of index values, indexes into the palette. Um, and of course, because we now have a smaller set of possible values, it's easier to employ lossless compression techniques. We already know that. We've reduced the, the set of symbols we're working with, so we then use LZW. Um, and uh, it's worth noting that, of course, LZW does allow us to optimize out patterns. LZW is, is a pretty humble scheme by our current standards, but it is pretty good 
good at identifying patterns that are common in line art. So GIF was not designed for photos. Uh, it was designed for line art. Um, and so patterns like if you have an image that has uh, very broad monolithic structures in it, so let's say we've got this red triangle inside the image and there's, there's a square there. I guess it's also red because I only ever have red available. Then there are going to be a bunch of rows of pixels where you've got a bunch of red pixels followed by a bunch of white pixels. And LZW is good at identifying the transition between the symbol for red, the symbol for red, the symbol for red, the symbol for white, the symbol for white. So LZW can actually do some pretty good work on that. I, I think LZSS or deflate in general might do better, but that's one reason why LZW was, was put to good use in, in the GIF format. One thing I'll observe about the GIF format is it is a lossless format, and therefore once you're done the palletization, you've got no control over the size of the image. You just get whatever you get. Um, so if you want to compress photos and you want to manipulate the photo to be palletized, you, you can do your best, but the image is going to be whatever size it's going to be. GIF doesn't give you a quality selector. Okay, so one more lossless format, and then we'll, we'll quit for this lecture, and in the next lecture we're going to come back and talk about color systems to a greater degree. Um, so back to the very beginning, we talked about PNG images. So PNG is a lossless format, uh, and that begs the question, what is it doing? We know it probably has some special technique. What is it doing to perform better than all three of our general techniques? It's valid that it could. We know that it's not surprising that a specialized technique does better than general techniques, but what exactly does it do? So PNG formally is a container, so PNG files can contain lots of stuff, just like .gz files. They, they actually have, there's metadata you can include, but in general what goes into a PNG file is a lossless encoding of an image. Um, and it, what we do to encode that image is first apply, in image compression we typically call this filtering, we first apply a transformation to the image data. We do not actually compress the image as an array of pixel values. Instead, we try and we, we employ a predictive coding scheme which uses the values of nearby pixels. So when I'm encoding this pixel here, PNG would use the color values of pixels nearby to predict the color value of this pixel with the logic that generally speaking, the, pic the color value of a pixel is correlated in some way to the color values of nearby pixels. So we first predict the value of the pixel, and then of course if there's any error in the prediction, we, we have to encode that. We encode that with delta compression, with differential encoding. We basically do exactly the same technique that we tried back in lecture 6 on that topography data. And it's worth observing that the topography data in lecture 6 had a lot in common with digital images. So it's no surprise that we used common techniques then and now. So PNG first does basically the same um, pre-processing that we did in lecture 6 to turn this array of pixel values into an array of predictions um, and error encodings, so, so delta encodings of error values, and then we just feed the filter data through deflate. So as I said earlier, image compression techniques are often image-specific techniques followed by general lossless compression, and what's neat to observe is that PNG, a modern lossless format, pretty much the go-to format for lossless image encoding, uses good old-fashioned deflate. And so for all those people out there, all the naysayers saying, why aren't we talking about lossless schemes from one year ago or two years ago? Well, the course doesn't have time for it. And Deflate and BZIP and LZMA are really important. And we can see that. Deflate's been showing up all course long. Um, so Deflate, of course, has LZSS. And that means that were there large regions of the image that were the same color, so line art style images, um, PNG has already built in some RLE functionality to handle that. So because LZSS comes with RLE for free. Um, and of course the predictive encoding is also nice because if I look at a row of pixels and the color values are sort of increasing gradually, so if I think about like the green value, the green channel is increasing gradually, then just like how we saw in lecture number six, predictive encoding can help um, to, uh, I guess, amortize the difference between colors over pixels, uh, and the prediction can help us estimate that if we've been noticing that the green channel is increasing, it might continue to increase. So although in general we don't compress photos with lossless schemes, PNG does have some advantages for lossless encoding of photos that other lossless schemes before it, like GIF, didn't have. Now that's all great, I guess, but we're done talking about lossless compression. We want to talk about lossy things. So in the next uh, lecture, I'm going to talk about a color conversion scheme that is often used in lossy schemes, like JPEG, like most streaming video formats. And then two lectures from now, I'm going to talk about the discrete cosine transform, which is the key transformation used in JPEG and in the vast majority of uh, video um, uh, processing, video compression schemes that are used these days.